Okay, we are in the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Last time, we ended reading at verse 59. Now, if you haven't already seen that teaching, you, you want to review that to get some background for it. Now, I'll briefly summarize that Jesus was teaching what seemed strange to us. Uh, metaphors of eating flesh and drinking his blood. Uh, in this context, his claim to be the bread of life that came down from heaven, and in that setting, it was understood that he was not talking about physically cutting people apart or tearing himself apart, but it was uh, talking about a total uh, trust in him that, that really involved taking his life into ours. And of course, life, uh, the Bible says in, in the Hebrew scriptures, it says over and over that the, the life of the flesh is in the blood. So that's that life, taking his life into ours, um, is that is a parallel to drinking and eating flesh and blood. So hopefully that's helpful to, to get that clear in your mind. It's not talking about cannibalism, but just as the, the bread and drink is needed to sustain physical life in our lives, having an intimate relationship with Jesus, taking his life into ours, so to speak, is necessary to sustain, to sustain spiritual life. Uh, the, list, the listeners that day that were listening to him they wanted a good king to rule over them. They were tired of having uh, the Romans and the corrupt Jewish leaders being their, their political leaders. Um, they remember the stories they remember seeing in Solomon's day where everything was peace and there was wisdom coming from the king. And they wanted that again. Uh, they were tired of being abused. And, uh, but Jesus came, they thought, oh, this guy's going to be like that. And... All of a sudden, he's talking about eating of him or, or fellowshipping with him, taking him in personally into their lives and having an intimate connection. And they were going to have to think long and hard about whether this was something they wanted to, to have in their life. It was not what they had looked for. And uh, to make it even worse, the enemies of our Lord were trying to confuse the situation and you know, suggested cannibalism. And uh, Even though they did that, I, the main people that were there weren't fooled. They knew that what he was talking about. And so that's a little background today. I'm going to pick up, um, continue reading, reading Jesus' teaching uh, from the New King James Version, the Gospel of John, chapter 6, beginning at verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no man can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. Verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Jesus, I mean of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. Now there's a lot going on in this passage. That's the end of the chapter. Um, but I thought it was really interesting uh, that uh, the, the 666 of John's gospel is very fitting. Uh, of course, in the book of Revelation, 666 is called the number of the beast, the, uh, the evil worldwide authority who opposes God at the end times. Um, but we know the chapter and, and verse numbers that the scriptures are divided up into. We're not in the original. They're not part of the scriptures. But they're handy sometimes. Um, if, if it comes up, 666 comes up in conversation, it'd be great to pull out your scripture and just say, oh, let's look at John 666, which says, from that time, many of the disciples went back and walked with him no more. 
And you can share that to illustrate the evil and the futility of someone turning their back on Christ. And don't stop there. Just keep reading verses 67 through 69 as well. Um, and you can share that Jesus is the one that gives eternal life. And it's, you, know, you can trust in him completely in him and not turn away from him. <clears throat> so again, um, these little things that we see in the scriptures give us opportunities to share and to help fulfill the great commission that Jesus gave us to share the gospel with every creature. So our first life lesson is use every opportunity you have to encourage people to follow Jesus. Use every opportunity you have to encourage people to follow Jesus. Now let's dig in starting at the, our text today at verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Now his disciples here are, are in the broad sense of the word. And this means those who had favored him had become his adherents, so to speak, uh, much as you might uh, favor a, a presidential candidate today. Um, it's not referring to those who have become true followers with their full commitment to him. Now, because a lot of times we think of his, inner, his disciples as uh, the inner circle, the ones we call the apostles. Now, those would have been called the twelve, and we actually do see that in this passage. So, Generally, the disciples that were there, those that were, had said, oh, I'm, I'm going to follow this guy. I'm, I'm backing, you know, I'm backing this candidate for, for king. Um, what exactly did they mean when they heard this and said it's a hard saying or literally a hard word? Well, as I have to do so many times, I turn to resources that are smarter than me. And I found out that the, the Greek word here is skleros, skleros. I don't know what that means, but I found out uh, it doesn't mean that it's hard to understand, but it means it's hard to accept. You know, when you say somewhere to somebody, man, that's hard. You know, there's, there's lots of meaning. So it means it's hard to accept. I like the way the Amplified Bible um, uh, translates it and expands on it. It says in that verse, it says, this is a hard and difficult and strange saying an offensive and unbearable message. Who can stand to hear it? Who can be expected to listen to such a teaching? So that was the intent of their heart as they were saying these things. And it reminded me of Mark Twain's, you may have heard of Mark Twain being quoted as saying, it ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me, it's the parts that I do understand. So <laughs> this was what was happening. Likewise, the synagogue that day, it was the parts that they did understand that were disturbing to them. Verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to this to them, does this offend you? <laughs> Understatement of the year. <laughs> so what we've been seeing in this chapter <clears throat> is a sharp contrast between the deliverance from the oppression that people had come to expect. They come to expect that in a Messiah. And then what the true deliverance that uh, Jesus would give from sin and death and what that really meant. In Isaiah 55, 8 to 9, we read, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, if you've been with us for a while, you've probably read that chapter, Isaiah 55, several times by now. Let's do it again. Another homework assignment. Read it again. See what God had told them to expect in a Messiah, and then contrast that with what the nation of Israel was actually expecting. There's really a sharp contrast between the, a political savior and a spiritual savior that God had intended and that God had sent in Jesus Christ. Um, the events of this chapter make it all too clear that following Jesus meant something different than what they'd anticipated. They thought they wanted peace, defined as the lack of the fighting and conflict Jesus came to give an inner peace and joy. No matter what conflict was happening outside, that was going to happen. They thought they wanted free food, <laughs> in this passage especially, to sustain human life until they grew old. Jesus came to give them food that would give them true, real life forever. When they took offense and complained, they expected their leaders to back down and apologize and change your mind to please them. When they were offended by Jesus' teaching, what happened? Well, he not only stood his ground, but
But in love and true authority, he challenged and confronted them even more. So not at all what they were expecting. And, and yes, Jesus did understand the offense that many of his listeners were taking in his teaching. Yet he didn't change his teaching. His message was not to change the feelings of the people or, or to change their circumstances. Jesus came to change their lives and our lives. Now, aren't we a lot, a lot like that today? You know, we, we think, oh, well, those people. Well, it's us he's talking to as well. Uh, we focus on getting more money so we can have what we want than changing our hearts so that we're content with, so we will want what we have. We look to the government to make laws to change people's behavior and limit the evil things. And yet, what should we be doing? Instead, we should be loving the people around us enough to show them that following God's ways is better for them and for everyone else too. So, you know, we, we see things that even in, in the lives of, of couples, even in brothers and sisters, uh, that, that uh, you know, having issues in a marriage. I, I'm saddened when I see a couple give up on their marriage when they hit a really rough spot in the road instead of learning and, and growing from these. Uh, a well-known pastor and Bible teacher, Warren Wearsby, uh, wrote in, in a book said uh, a little boy was leading his sister up a mountain path and on the, and the way was not too easy why this isn't a path at all the little girl complained it's all rocky and bumpy and her brother replied sure the bumps are what you climb on that's a remarkable piece of philosophy the only thing we can depend on is the rule and reign of Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord if he is on the throne of our lives we can face tomorrow with confidence and courage. Great quote from Warren Wearsby. Friend, that's what the Bible is teaching us here. Life lesson for us today, when the path God puts us on gets rocky and hard, don't turn back, but climb over that bumpy ground so we can grow spiritually. When the path God puts us on gets rocky and hard, don't turn back, but climb over that bumpy ground so we can grow spiritually. So here Jesus was saying, and then the next verse, he, he, after he said, does this offend you too? He asked in verse 62, what then if you should see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? Um, our brother just shared with me this morning about uh, the bread of heaven descended and also in sacrifices in the Hebrew scriptures, the, that bread ascended as smoke up into heavens as a sweet sacrifice to God. It's kind of interesting uh, that he would say this as well. But, you know, I, I see when Jesus says this, I just love the way he talks to us, and the meaning will touch us right where we are and speak to exactly what we're thinking at the time. Again, there's a, a big, uh, the crowd here was mixed. For those that were thinking they didn't want a close personal relationship, he was saying, if my words offend you here, what are you going to do in heaven where you live with me forever? And you have to answer to God for the actions in your life. Will you tell him you didn't like my words and didn't want to be a friend of his son? For those who wanted to make him an earthly king, he was saying, what would happen to you if you really got me to be your king here and then I ascend back into heaven where I came from? Who's going to protect you and keep the peace then? For those who thought beyond all reason that this weird thought that Jesus really did mean they should eat parts of his body to have everlasting life, he was saying, you're really going to be offended when I rise back up to heaven and you realize there's literally, literally no way to be in contact and eat my, my flesh and blood. Then there were the religious folks who were already ticked off that Jesus was claiming to be from heaven. And he was saying, what are you going to do when you see with your own eyes that I really am from heaven and now I'm leaving going back to heaven and you've wasted all your time here trying to oppose the very God in heaven that you claim to worship and represent. I mean, it has so many meanings, but it speaks to each person's heart. Finally, there were others that were taking him at his word. And these, you know, I, I want to be this person. Uh, they were believing and understanding and thinking, wow, that's going to be so wonderful. I might get to see Jesus going back up to reunite with his heavenly father. And I'll get to do that one day too, because he's given me that life. So how about you? What words is God, what words are God speaking in your heart today from Jesus' words here? Well, that's for you to answer. 
But for those who are listening closely, Jesus is about to give a key to understanding his message today and, and actually for many of his teachings. Verse 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Now, you can try to understand the teachings of Jesus in one of two ways, by the spirit of God or in the flesh, that is by your own natural understanding. Let's see how these work out. Uh, let's start with the flesh. Since we're all born in the flesh, it comes easy and naturally for us. How does the flesh work? Well, let's look at the scriptures. First, flesh is corrupt. Genesis 6, 12, so God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Not doing so good. <laughs> flesh is weak and temporary. Psalm 78, verses 38 to 39 say, but he being full of compassion forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up his wrath for he remembered that they were but flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. Now, flesh can also has its advantages. It can appear to be beautiful. But at the same time, it's nothing compared with the words of God. Isaiah 40, uh, the end of verse 6 and up through verse 8 says, All flesh is grass, and its loveliness is like the flower of the field. <clears throat> the grass withers, and the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God word of our God stands forever. Now our, our flesh can reproduce more flesh. Lovely to see as, as we have a, a new little grandbaby. Makes a lot of noise sometimes. <laughs> uh, also, it's a corrupt and weak and temporary and short-lived as the verses have said. We studied back in John uh, chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 where Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. So we see in a contrast, the Spirit is what gives life. Jesus' words are spirit. He says right here, Jesus, you know, the words I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. So if the Spirit is working in us, his words are as food to a living human. But if not, if it's not through his spirit, they're like food to a dead man. You ever talk to somebody, talk to them about scriptures, maybe in an advanced thing, and you realize that you're talking to a dead person. They have not been, their spirit's not been revived. They don't understand the things of God. They're reading something that Jesus is, is speaking to a believer <clears throat> to, to help them grow in their faith, and the person you're speaking to doesn't have faith to start with. So it's like trying to feed a dead man. That's, why, that's what's happening in there. So first, someone needs to be born of the Spirit. You know, even, um, even me, I, I switched my notes to the wrong page. <laughs> even, even the flesh of Christ laid down for a sacrifice for sin, even the, his sacrifice for us profits us nothing unless we do accept it, unless we are born of the Spirit of God. One reason that people dislike what Jesus says is uh, they don't try to understand them. Uh, a literal fleshly interpretation of his words can be confusing. It doesn't do him any good, but the spiritual meaning is so powerful. So we also read in 1 Corinthians 2, 14 to 16, but the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them. Like that, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things. Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Some find fault with Christ's sayings, and, but why? Well, we, when we take a look into it, we find out the fault was in themselves. It is only to earthly minds that the spiritual things are senseless, but spiritual minds relish these things. So, life lesson for us today, what... what is our response? <clears throat> Ask the Holy Spirit to fill and guide you when studying the words of God. Then they will be profitable to you. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill and guide you when studying the word of God. Then they will be profitable to you. Okay, verse 64. Jesus says, 
But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. Because Jesus is God, he had the power to know the hearts of men. He was never deceived by the false light, like we studied back in John 1, nor was he deceived by the one who would betray him. And at the same time, even knowing these things, he offered life to every person that would receive him. Have you considered that Jesus knew these things, some of these things, as a man submitted to the Father and led by the Holy Spirit, rather than just because he was God? John 2, 18 to 20 tell us, I mean, 1 John 2, 18 to 20 tell us, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest, made obvious, that none of them were, were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. You know, it gives, gives me a little hope, you know, <laughs> because even though I know Jesus is God and he could have used his godly powers to discern that these people were, were not believers, they were not sincere in their trust in God. Um, sometimes when we're talking to people about the Lord, um, I just have to ask them, you know, are, are you wanting an answer or are you wanting to argue? If you're wanting an answer, I'd love to share the scriptures with you. If you're wanting to argue, I'm not interested in doing that because it's not going to help anything. So believers who are filled with the Holy Spirit don't need to be deceived. Uh, there are many in our time that say that they're Christians, but they're not really truly following Jesus. Um, I hate to say it, many of them are actually in churches, leading churches. Um, so many people are being deceived. Many are literally intentionally deceiving others for their own selfish purposes. So Jesus comes back and emphasizes another truth when he observes that there are people that are not really believers. Verse 65, and he said, therefore I have said to you that no man, excuse me, that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. And remember, the father, our heavenly father oversees this entire process. He has the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts to draw us to come to Jesus. And the simple response of accepting Jesus, we acknowledge our Father's truths, the Spirit's life-giving power, and Jesus' authority and divinity. And that without the Father's drawing, that no one can really believe and trust in Jesus. And I think the next verse is a result of this teaching. People didn't... People didn't understand at that moment that Jesus wasn't just a charismatic speaker or a politician looking for votes. Um, his divinity was real. And if you didn't believe his heavenly father, it was simply not possible to believe in Jesus either. Jesus had rebuked them for their material and earthly motivations for following him, their selfish motivations. If they sought him for food in a, in a great kingdom instead of being drawn by the father, they'd not really come to him at all. Perhaps they'd follow him, as we read before, halfway around the Sea of Galilee looking for him, but they could not truly come to Jesus in the sense of, in the sense of believing in him and trusting him and loving him apart from the Father's drawing. Verse 66 of John 6, we mentioned earlier, from that time many of his, his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Many went back to their houses, their families, their jobs that they had left for a time to follow him around. Uh, these were people that had self-enrolled in Christ's school. They had not gotten approved by the Father or drawn by the Father. But when they turned back, they likely took leave of him and his doctrine forever. It's a hard thing. We see in verse 61, you know, where the people had picked up an offense. Brothers and sisters, this is truly dangerous. Uh, picking up offense to, offenses is damaging. It's poisonous uh, to us uh, to pick up. And so, you know, <laughs> trying to avoid it at all costs. I don't even, even if I feel like I'm offended, I don't like to say I'm offended. And that's because it, it communicates a deep, lasting anger of something that's happened in the past. Maybe you were treated wrongly or got an unfair or, or unjust shake or, or you were misjudged. That happens, but you, you carry that perceived 
grievance or judge or grudge around with you for a long time. And uh, the longer you deep, the longer this, this deepens in you and you, you get this process embedded, this thought embedded in you, in your being, then you're more quickly take offense the next time something happens that even looks similar. Or even if it's not even close to what you felt offended by, uh, you know, you, you throw that, oh, they must be trying to offend me again. And it, it gets really bad. You can, you can respond with hostility to situations that are totally innocent. So avoid this. So what had happened, Jesus had rightly observed that they wanted to follow him because they might feed him. But they didn't want to follow him because he was God. And so at first, they're, they're pretending it's not the case. Oh, no, no, no. We want to believe you. Tell us what we need to do. But then it ended up developed into criticism. They ended up twisting his words. And finally, he didn't back down on the truth, but he doubled down on the truth. He kept repeating it. And at that point, they publicly and loudly left, as we saw in verse 66, left in an offended huff. You know, it's kind of the opposite of, of baptism. In baptism, you're, you publicly proclaim, I am a follower of Christ. Now, these people were publicly proclaiming a disrespect and turning away from Christ. That's a hard thing to overcome. Um, we have a lot of pride in our lives, you know, just face it. I, that happens in us, and it's, it's hard to take turn back, turn your, um, change your mind when you've already publicly made a statement. So um, turning, back, turning your back on Jesus is really a strange thing when you really consider all that he offers us and who he is. But it's very common, and don't be surprised when you see that happen. Here we see many that went back. But I looked, and between verse 66 and 67, there must be some missing verses. Okay, Because I, I was looking where Jesus chased after those who were leaving, pleading with them to come back and follow him. Right? They should be there, right? No, that didn't happen. They didn't leave verses out. They didn't miss that part of the story. Um, he'd already explained back in verses 45 and 46 what, how people would come to him. And they had not heard from the Father. They had not, the Father had not drawn to them. They did not believe in the words of the Father. And so they weren't believers to start with. And Jesus doesn't force people to follow him. Jesus doesn't bring people kicking and screaming into the kingdom of God. It's a volunteer kingdom. It's a volunteer army, so to speak, of the Lord. So our life lesson uh, here is we follow Jesus because we are lovingly drawn to him, not because we are forced to do so. We follow Jesus because we are lovingly drawn to him, not because we are forced to do so. And unfortunately, when some backslide, they often pull others along with them. Apostasy, fancy $3 word for uh, falling away, it's, it's infectious. Uh, there have been some, and I'm sure in this crowd there are probably some that were truly being drawn to Jesus, but they were influenced by those that were openly rejecting him at this time. And that explains why Jesus asked the question he does in the next verse, verse 67. Then Jesus said to the 12, his own disciples there, his close group, do you also want to go away? What a question to ask your closest friends. You know, the, the other, other people leaving Jesus didn't prove that Jesus was false. It didn't discredit those who were still with him. But Jesus didn't force anybody to follow him. And that included his closest followers, the, the apostles. Uh, but something else we're, we're not seeing here, a, a more colloquial uh, rendering of this translation would be you don't want to go away, do you? It was kind of the, in, the, in the Greek language, it's expected, the response was no, kind of a rhetorical question. Uh, you don't want to go away, do you? So sometimes you might look at that and say, oh, Jesus was in despair. He's like, oh, do you want to leave too? He was scared they were leaving. No, he was not scared they were going to leave him, um, but it was in confidence. And they understood what following Jesus really meant. Jesus, but Jesus still allowed everyone to examine their own hearts, their own motives in following him, and make their own choices. And he still does that for us today. 
Well, let's see what the response was. Uh, here's a guy that uh, tends to speak up a lot, verse 68. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. When we get discouraged or confused, you just think about it. Where else would we go except to Jesus? Now, this is the second time in the gospel where Jesus was uh, called Lord by the disciples. First time was back in verse 34, during the same teaching in the synagogue. Then this confession of having made Jesus Lord was telling. They recognized the value of the spiritual was higher than the earthly or fleshly concern that had caused others to leave. Peter recognized Jesus as having the authority to keep his promise to give real eternal life. Life lesson for us is when you get tired or discouraged, and others are rejecting Jesus. Remember that only Jesus can give you real eternal life. It's a little long. When you get tired or discouraged and others are rejecting Jesus, remember that only Jesus can give you real eternal life. And that brings us to the rest of what Peter had to say back in response in verse 69. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter had acknowledged what the Father had revealed to him. And we see in another one of the parallel Gospels that uh, Jesus had actually spoken to Peter and told him that that is brought to you. God has revealed this to you, that, you are, you, that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. We know that God reveals this to every person who listens to his voice. This is a great foundational truth that their faith and ours is built upon. Peter speak for the whole group here. Spoke up, all of us, but Jesus knew better. Verse 70, Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the 12? And one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the 12. <laughs> John loves to throw little spoiler alerts, <laughs> little spoilers in the, in the gospel here. But, um, you know, Jesus chose everyone. Nobody knew who was the bad apple. Honestly, I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us if Jesus knew that Judas was the one. We don't know when he knew that. But one of the things we, we read in uh, Matthew chapter 26 about the Last Supper, verse 20 to 22, says, when evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say, Lord, is it I? They all asked, is it I? Why didn't they know who it was? He didn't have a big sign on his head, I'm the betrayer. Jesus had not treated anybody differently. Jesus knew they were all human. They all knew they were all human and knew that, hey, maybe, maybe there was something in their hearts that was not right. But even though he knew who would betray him at this point, Jesus didn't even tell them at that point. He gave everyone a chance. And throughout the ministry, if he knew at the beginning, he still gave everyone the equal chance throughout his ministry um, to, to trust him, to choose to trust him. Notice in the synagogue in our text, Jesus had taught everyone Again, not only those who were true followers of him, but those who, even those who were trying to discredit him. Why? Some would come to believe, and God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, there's something else amiss here. I think the fact, and sometimes we, we miss this, the fact that God even used Judas to advance the kingdom of God. Uh, just before the, this passage, just before the feeding of the 5,000, we read in Mark uh, 6, 12 to 13, it says the disciples had gone out in pairs. So they went out and preached that people should repent. Except for Judas, because he was going to turn back. No, it doesn't say that. He said, and they went out. So they went out and preached that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Yes, Judas even did mighty works in the name of Jesus for the kingdom of God. Yet deep in his heart, Judas was looking for Jesus to be an earthly king. Inwardly, he rejected the, the truth of being born of the Spirit of God and seeing things spiritually. 
And it breaks our hearts sometimes when we see that mighty, you know, that, that men of God, that we see many times publicly are out there, they're doing great and mighty work for the kingdom of God, and later we all of a sudden realize they were flawed men. Now, sometimes they were sincere and true, and they gave in to a struggle they had with sin. Other times they never knew God to begin with, never truly knew God to begin with. So what do we do with their works when we see that? Um, look with me at Luke 9, 49 to 50. John had answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not forbid him, for he, is not against us. he who is not against us is on our side. <coughs> That's a hard one to follow, okay? When you really feel someone is, is, mis, is, is not following the Lord or they're not with you on your page, um, it, it's difficult. Um, <laughs> so somebody has said, you know, be, be careful when you get to heaven, tiptoe past some of the doors because people in that room, uh, they, they think they're the only ones here. <laughs> but, you know, God, God has so many people doing his work and he sorts it all out. Life lesson for us is to keep on trusting in Jesus. Keep yourself right and doing the work of God, and he will use all the results for his glory. Keep on trusting in Jesus. Keep yourself right and doing the work of God, and he will use all the results for his glory. It's an interesting um, word to finish up the chapter on, even though... Judas would eventually betray, betray Jesus. He followed his own agenda instead of following Jesus. God still used the kingdom work that Judas did to bring more and more people into the kingdom of God. Think on these things, friends. Study the scriptures. Let God speak to you and let the Holy Spirit fill you and guide you every day. Take in what Jesus did. This uh, reread re the chapter now that we've gone over it in, in a lot of detail. Reread the chapter and, and just see how God wants us, wants, has drawn us to him, has drawn us to Jesus, and wants us to uh, fellowship, wants us to take in the Lord. And uh, don't let these outside things interfere with our relationship with Jesus. As we close, I'd like to pray a blessing over you from God's word. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen.